So right on the heels of my last video talking about a pretty sad Star Wars Armada announcement, let's do some happy Star Wars Armada content, because just immediately after that announcement, literally about 12 hours afterwards, I played in a local Armada tournament and uh, had a good time, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go over all my games, and I'm going to try to do it in as a new player-friendly way as I possibly can, because I know there's a big population of my viewer base who are all 40k players or play other miniature games and don't know anything about Armada. So if you're one of those people, I'm going to try to make it as accessible to you as possible. Anyway, let's get into some games. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi. We're talking about a Star Wars Armada tournament that I played in this past weekend. In this video, I'll just go over my list real quick. I'll be talking about the three games that I played over the weekend, and I'll be talking about my opponent's list and trying to give a little bit of an overview of Star Wars Armada for people who aren't super familiar with the system. First off, I'll talk about my list. Now, what I'm going to do here is try to elucidate all of the decisions that I made during list building. I'm not pretending that this list is particularly groundbreaking or even that I came up with most of it. It's uh, pretty stock standard stuff. But I will talk about the role that each of the upgrade cards and each of the pieces of the list fall into so that if you don't know much about the system, then uh, you can you know, know what's going on. So first off, I was playing Imperial Navy. I like their playstyle. They're very maneuver oriented. All of the damage for Imperial ships typically comes out of their front. In Star Wars Armada, your ship is divided into four quadrants, which aren't necessarily even and aren't the same from ship to ship. So some ships may have more powerful side arcs. Some ships may be more powerful in their front or even in their rear. And ships will have different sizes of arcs, which makes it easier or harder to get a shot with that side or be shot in that side. Imperial ships tend to have very wide and powerful front arcs with a lot of attack dice, which means that their game plan is typically straightforward, but they also have to be maneuverable enough to be able to swing around on their opponent if the initial joust doesn't do enough damage to destroy them. To that end, the commander I'm playing today is Moff Jurgerod. He allows me to take damage on my ships in order to, to massively increase their maneuverability. So he kind of falls into that playstyle very appropriately, where he's using those big front arcs to make an initial attack. And then he can either use that maneuverability to peel out of the opponent's arcs in order to not get shot back, but then also potentially try to get subsequent attacks on future turns. I think he's one of the most powerful characters in the game. He's actually one of the cheapest admirals in the Imperial stable. And I'll do a little demonstration momentarily here of exactly how how maneuverable he can make your ships alongside some of the other combos that I was using in this list. It's it's pretty ludicrous. I've got two Gozanti cruisers in the list. These are little flotillas. They don't really do much damage, but they are very cheap. Only 23 points for the base chassis. One of them has Darth Vader on it. He allows me to kill the officers on my other ships in order to allow those ships to reroll their attacks. That is a pretty cool ability, and mostly it's in there for the synergy with Minister Tua, who I'll talk about momentarily. Darth Vader's Gozanti has a comms net that allows it to pass command tokens to other ships around uh, when it reveals its command dial. Command actions are a core part of Star Wars Armada. Basically, your, your ships will dial up a series of commands that they'll use over the course of the game. Larger ships tend to have to set these a couple turns in advance, so playing the larger ships kind of needs some foresight, which is a really interesting dynamic. But if you don't use the full effect of your command, you can essentially bank that effect for later using a command token for a lesser effect. And the comms net allows the Gazanti cruisers to send their command tokens to the larger ships, which turns on a lot of synergies and just helps out your game plan be a little bit more consistent. The four command tokens in Star Wars Armada, by the way, are Concentrate Fire, which allows you to add or reroll attack dice in your attack pool. Navigate, which allows you to increase or decrease your speed. And if you resolve the command to dial, you can actually increase or decrease your maneuverability as well. That one's actually a pretty big deal because normally ships can't change how fast they're moving in Armada. You have like a forward momentum. So once you've set yourself to be moving a particular speed, you have to move that speed until you are able to change your speed by performing, for example, the navigate command. Ships will have different levels of maneuverability depending on how fast they're going and exactly what their navigation chart says. So being able to change those on a dime with that navigate command is a really super big deal. That's a very different dynamic than almost any other miniatures game where your control over where your pieces can move is pretty much absolute. Engineering, which allows you to repair shields or hull damage. And last, squadron, which lets you command your squadrons, which makes them much more effective than if they had activated uncommanded. We have a second Gozanti cruiser in the list. This one's being led by Hondo Onaka. 
Shaka. He allows me to gain command tokens at the start of a round. This is usually pretty useful if you need to, you know, get a, a navigate token to increase or decrease your speed at some point, or to just fix some shields, something like that. It is especially important with some of the synergies that I'll talk about later on. The downside of Hondo is that he's a once per game ability and... He also gives your opponents whatever command tokens you didn't choose. Now for the big ships. We have an Imperial 2 class Star Destroyer. This is the flagship, so Moff Jurgerod is commanding this one himself. He's also bringing along Wolf Ularin, which allows me to spend command tokens without actually spending them. He'll just regenerate a copy of that command token. And that's important if you want to especially engineer. So the uh, Star Destroyer can get an engineering token, potentially from the Comsnet Gozanti can reveal an engineering dial, spend the dial and the token together. That actually allows it to repair two hull damage on itself, which is a pretty big deal. It only has 11 hit points. I'm only, that's actually a lot. But that means it can essentially repair like 20% of its total hull damage. In addition, you can also regenerate shields with that. It can regenerate up to three shields with the command dial plus the token. To make it even more survivable, we have reinforced blast doors, which essentially increases its hull points by three. That's a defensive retrofit, which is a pretty competitive slot. The other really good defensive retrofit upgrade is electronic countermeasures, which allows you to spend defense tokens that were accuracy. Defense tokens are essentially how you mitigate damage in Star Wars Armada. When you roll your attacks, all of your attack dice just add damage to the pool effectively. So there's no hit roll, wound roll, saving throw, anything like that. You'll just roll a number of hits and your opponent will suffer that damage. However, defense tokens are a way to shift that around. Most ships can redirect damage from one hull zone to another. So if you have shields on one hull zone and no shields on another and your opponent's attacking the shieldless hull zone, you can use a redirect defense token to shift that damage. Brace is also a very powerful one that not a lot of ships have, but is also the first one to get locked down, if you roll results called accuracies, which allow you to block your opponent from spending particular tokens, and that allows you to half the damage that you would take from an attack. So the effect of electronic countermeasures is it stops your opponent from stopping you from mitigating damage. The downside is that it takes an engineering token to refresh after every time you use it. And in this list, I'm kind of strapped on engineering tokens, so I elected not to take that, even though it makes your ships much more survivable, especially against the big enemy attacks that, that Brace token's really good against. We also have some offensive upgrades on this guy. We have Leading Shots, which allows him to spend dice to reroll other dice. We also have XI-7 Turbo Lasers, which only allows opponents to redirect a single damage from your attacks, which is pretty effective, especially if you're drilling into a single hull zone with the big front arc shot from that Star Destroyer. A lot of times, if you're not able to stop your opponent from redirecting damage, they can spread a lot of damage out around their shields very effectively, and that means that they don't take much hull damage, which is really, you know, how you actually destroy ships. So, those XI-7 turbo lasers, stopping a lot of that redirected damage means that these big, huge shots are just going to drill right through the shields in whatever hull zone you're attacking and start hitting your opponent's hull. Once their hull points are depleted, then they will be destroyed. Last but not least, we have a little bit of spice on this guy. We have the Chimera upgrade, which allows it to take a fleet command upgrade. In this case, I've taken all fighters follow me, which increases the speed of my fighters. Uh, as we talk about the rest of the list, you'll notice that there's basically no fighters, but... That's just there to trick you because the other effect of the Chimera upgrade is it allows me at the start of a round to flip out that, that Fleet Command upgrade card for a different one. These Fleet Command upgrade cards exchange a token of a particular type for a universal effect that will benefit my entire fleet. The most important ones are Intensify Firepower, which takes a Concentrate Fire token, but allows me to change one of my attack dice on every attack that round into a hit. Shields to Maximum is another good one. It just regenerates a shield at the start of each of my ship's activation. So it combined with all of the other engineering effects that I have using the token with, with Wolf Ularin, as well as the engineering dial that allows me to potentially regenerate four shields on the Imperial Star Destroyer, which is very nice. And the coolest one is Take Evasive Action, which increases my maneuverability even more. Alongside Moff Jurgerod's effects, that can actually get sort of an unnecessary amount of maneuverability out of these Imperial ships, but it is super fun to pull off when you can do some crazy U-turns with these guys. Lastly, we have an Onager Star Destroyer. This is just a big artillery piece that has an interesting special ability of being able to fire past the long range than any other ship can fire. There are some downsides. It has a very narrow arc in which it can do that. Basically, it just got one big gun 
that it's going to be firing at a potential 24 inches, whereas most of the time the maximum range of other ships is up to 12. The Orbital Bombardment Particle Cannon is the upgrade that allows it to fire that maximum distance. It also has a secondary effect that like does an explosion around whatever ship it's shooting at. That doesn't really come into play. We have XI-7 Turbo Lasers on that as well to block some redirects on my opponent's ships, as well as Gunnery Chief Farnillion who can steal dice from an attack to replace them in a later attack. So essentially she starts with a blank die on her card most of the time. If you're going second in a game, she starts with any facing of a die, which is much more useful, but going second is typically worse. And she can swap that die for whatever die that you're rolling. So this means that if you're in an instance where an additional hit in your attack or something wouldn't really do much, you can switch it out with the blank die that you used. Then at a later date, you can use that hit that she stole for an attack to guarantee some additional damage. She didn't end up actually being that useful in this particular list. I think that's mostly because I was trying to go first most of the time and she doesn't very do very much going first. So I'll probably look at replacing her in the future, but I'm not really sure what she gets replaced with. We also have Minister Tua on that Onager, which allows it to take a defensive retrofit, which it can't normally. I've elected to take reinforced blast doors on this thing as well, which just makes it a little bit hardier. If you are using shields to maximum and pumping it full of tokens with Hondo or the comms net goes on to, it can be relatively tanky, especially since its front arc is incredibly well armored and has a starting shield value of five, which is pretty impressive. The other synergy is with Darth Vader. All Minister Tua does is adds an upgrade slot to that ship during list building, which means that once she's deployed, she doesn't actually do anything, which means that Darth Vader being able to kill her and discard her in order to allow me to reroll dice doesn't actually have any negative effect in the ship. So it's just like a free roll. I can reroll whatever dice I want once per game. And that actually was a lot of dice fixing that was super helpful, even more so than the expensive Gunnery Chief Arnillion. Lastly, we do have two squadrons in the list, Sienna Re and Vale and Rudor. These are two ace squadrons, which means they also have defense tokens, one of which negates all of the dice in an opponent's attack, which makes them very difficult to kill. That's a pretty common combo you'll see, especially in a lot of fighter light Imperial lists. Imperials are, are good at going fighter light or heavy, but if you're going light, having one or two squadrons just to stymie your opponent's bombing for a turn if they're trying to bomb your big ships to death is very useful, and Sienna and Valen are a very annoying combo of characters. Sienna has an ability that obstructs all of the attacks against you, when an attack is obstructed, it removes an attack die from the pool. And since fighters often only attack with three or maybe four attack die, and their attack dice are less effective than a ship's would be when shooting another ship, that's actually a really big deal. It makes Sienna very difficult to kill. In addition to that, she can also attack you back if you attack her, which means that your attack is doing less damage to her. She can probably ignore all of it with one of her defense tokens, and then she can come back and ping you for a couple damage. That's compounded by the fact that as long as you are fighting someone else, Valen Rudor can't be attacked. So Sienna Re essentially screens for Valen Rudor. He's got a very consistent attack pool against non-ace fighters. He's good at killing just regular fighters whereas Sienna is a little bit better against aces just because of the color of dice that she has. And that means that Valen Rudor will just continue to shoot until Sienna's dead. And these two aces, as long as you can continue to support them, can actually win a lot of squadron fights against more minor and especially generic squadrons that are a lot cheaper. And against more powerful squadron lists, they will typically take about an entire round of shooting from an enemy squadron ring to kill them, which gives you valuable time to get your Star Destroyers in range to kill their carriers or just score enough points and run away so that you win the game. I guess Said, they're very common in a lot of Imperial lists and uh, for good reason. But anyway, that's the whole list. I'm coming in at 391 points. Typically you play 400 in a game of Star Wars Armada and that gives me a nine point bid. The player with the lower points total in their list actually chooses who goes first or second. There's benefits and drawbacks to both. The first player has a little bit less control of activations because they will obviously have to be activating first each round, which in the early game is often worse because in Armada, you perform your unit's attacks before you move rather than after, which means that if the first player is moving up, there's a greater chance that they're going to move into the second player's attack range first which means the second player may get the first strike on them. The upside is that activating first in a round is very powerful and allows you to play very aggressively, move up forward aggressively, eat some damage, then immediately activate in an optimal position. The way missions are determined in Armada is that each list will actually feature three missions. The ones I've chosen for this list, which typically don't matter because I'm trying to go first, are Advanced Gunnery, Contested Outpost, and Solar Corona. This is a pretty standard mission loadout for a list like this. Advanced Gunnery may 
makes one of each player's ships more powerful at shooting in exchange for giving up additional victory points when that ship's destroyed. Contested Outpost puts a space station on the table that you score points for controlling at the end of the round, and the second player gets to place near them, so they will typically start controlling it. And Solar Corona just forces the first player to deploy all their stuff first, so you can see where it goes during the alternating deployment step at the start of the game, and then also makes their ships less accurate. So while it doesn't give up points, it does make them significantly worse at attacking you. So the other benefit of second player is that you are forced to use one of the second player's objectives, and the objectives tend to benefit the second player pretty significantly, especially stuff like Contested Outpost, where there's a space station that you're just sitting next to controlling and farming points, requires the first player to move aggressively and fight you, which essentially allows you to fight the battle on your terms. The objective selection step of Star Wars Armada list building is really interesting because you can build lists very specifically to try to get points on certain types of missions and then potentially bid low points in order to go second rather than first, which is a pretty interesting dynamic. In this list, we're basically just trying to put Imperial Star Destroyer into my opponent's face and blow them up with a bunch of guns. So we're going to be trying to go first. So I've John's in TTS here to do a little bit of a demonstration on exactly how maneuverable these uh, Imperial Star Destroyers can be with the combination of abilities that I've given them. Um, so we have two Imperial Star Destroyers here, and the standard Imperial Star Destroyer maneuver template uh, allows you to set a single yaw in your second and third joints on the navigation tool. So potentially, you know, you could you could move up to here, essentially. So you could do this. Jurgerod allows you to take damage to set your first yaw value up to two, which means that you can take a much harder angle. This is just innately a 90 degree angle right here. Take Evasive Action, the fleet command card, allows you to increase the yaw value of your final joint by one as well, which means you can potentially do this. In addition, if you've dialed a navigate command, you can also increase any of your yaw values by one, which means that we could potentially set this one to two as well, which means that we can basically move completely, completely around, turn almost entirely around. And that also allows you to potentially fire your big front arc attack at the same ship multiple times over the course of one to two rounds, which is absolutely phenomenal amounts of maneuverability that you can get out of these things. As someone who really likes taking game actions and making wild, you know, crazy movements, this is definitely my favorite thing in, in the game. Now, last week, I actually played in a, another Armada tournament, and I played a much different style of list, a much more passive list focused on lighter ships and a bunch of fighter squadrons to try to deal damage. And honestly, it was maybe kind of a misread on the meta game. I think. I played against a bunch of stuff I wasn't prepared for and mostly got blown up. I got a big win because I was able to use my mission selection pretty appropriately in round one. But after that, played against the stuff I wasn't really spec'd to kill and ended up going down one and two. Now, one of the big changes recently in Star Wars Armada, because they released a 1.5 version of the rules that had a couple of minor rules changes, was the introduction of a mechanic called pass tokens, which are tokens that a player gets if they are out activated by their opponent. You get pass tokens equal to the difference in the number of ships that each player has. So for example, if I have five ships and my opponent only has three, they would get three pass tokens. Although the player going first then loses a pass token if they have any. What I noticed in the previous tournament was I actually had a lot of people either bidding low, so they didn't put too many points aside to bid to try to go first, or they bid low to try to go second in order to get access to these pass tokens. So I actually was okay with just a nine point bid because I assumed that not a lot of people would be bidding particularly low to try to go first, which was very much the meta in the previous version of the game. That certainly makes the game a little bit smoother, but I still think going first is pretty good, especially for an aggressive list like this. But anyway, let's talk about this tournament and the list that I played against. So round one, I played against Jess and her Rebel Alliance. She was playing a Krista Agate list who is a commander that allows you essentially to burn your defense tokens. Normally, you would spend a defense token by flipping it face down, and then you could spend it again, but that would burn it and you wouldn't be able to use it in the future. Otherwise, they refresh every turn. But Krista Gate allows you to burn your defense tokens to spend them, even if they are locked down by an effect like an accuracy icon on one of your attack dice. Whatever ship she's on also gets an additional defense token, which typically makes it extremely tanky. 
She was on an MC-75 armored cruiser, which is a pretty mid-range rebel capital ship. It has a bunch of evenly distributed attack dice out of all of its hull zones and is good at almost any range. That had a bunch of upgrades on it, including Kate Kinnan Chalan, who allows it to reroll any of one color of attack dice. Early warning system, which is a very good upgrade at defending against squadrons because it obscures one of your hull zones every round. Because squadrons typically only attack with one or two dice against ships, if you are obscured, you are removing one attack dice from the pool, which means squadrons oftentimes can't attack you on that hull zone, which is pretty good. For larger ships like the Star Destroyers, it's not quite as useful because you're only reducing the attack dice by one. We also have external racks and heavy ion emplacements to buff its damage. External racks allows it to fire an additional two black missile attack dice at close range once per game. Heavy ion emplacements allows you to resolve an additional critical effects that drains the shields off of the target you're shooting at, which is very cool. We also have an MC-30 torpedo frigate with ordnance experts in torpedo racks. These are ships that tend to excel at close range range and are very difficult to kill. They have low hull points, which means you can actually just run into them a lot of times and kill them with ramming damage, but they're very difficult to kill with raw attacks because they have an immense number of shields and really good defense tokens. Foresight as well allows you to resolve your defense tokens for additional effects, which is very good, especially with Krista Agate. We also have two Hammerhead Scout Corvettes. These are little guys that are okay at long range, mostly just there to pad activations and deal a little bit of damage, as well as one GR-75 medium transport, which is just a flotilla that can sit around and activate some squadrons. Speaking of squadrons, we have three X-Wing squadrons escorting Nora Wexley, who allows them to resolve a critical effect to drain opponent's shields as well, sort of like the armored cruiser's ion emplacements. Now, my opponent didn't have a bid at all, so I get to choose whether I was first or second, and I wanted to go first, and we ended up playing on her salvage run mission. Now, this is one of my favorite missions in the game because not only does it add additional terrain features to the game, which I absolutely love, but it also enforces this very aggressive kind of in-your-face play style, which I think is the, the most interesting and fun way to play Star Wars Armada. I think it's also pretty good for me too. So I might be biased a little bit. The way salvage run works is it puts four objective tokens in the center of the table that your ships have to go try to collect to get additional victory points. I guess it's also important to talk about the actual victory conditions of Armada, which is that the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins kind of ostensibly, and you get victory points equal to the cost of ships and upgrades that you destroy. Missions will typically just add additional victory points on top of that or give you benefits that makes it easier to kill your opponent's ships. Because it's kind of difficult to actually engage in Armada, like I said before, you only shoot about 12 inches and you can actually just stop your units and not move them. It does mean that KG play can lead to some low scoring games. And as we'll talk about later on in the video, that does mean that a raw win-loss tournament structure doesn't actually really work for this game because it is absolutely possible for one player to literally just stall out their ships and try to win on just one or two points uh, over their opponent. In this instance, anyway, Salvage Run adds us four objective tokens to the middle that we're trying to go get. And to that end, I moved up aggressively to try to take them out. Salvage Run also requires that all of the obstacle features get placed around the center of the table. The train in Armada is actually player placed. The players take turns placing the obstacle tokens and their position is often dictated by the mission. I was able to get the Star Destroyer up right in the middle of the table early. My opponent wasn't quite able to get her ships in close enough range to pick up all of the tokens at once. I think she could only grab one or two. And I was threatening a pickup with the Star Destroyer. The Destroyer was approaching at kind of an oblique angle. And my initial plan was to knock out my opponent's three small ships to prevent her from picking up those tokens, grabbing as many of the tokens as I could myself, and then peeling out to try to score the win there. I ended up activating the Star Destroyer early on turn two to get a good shot into one of my opponent's scout frigates and destroy it. And I then used some of the ridiculous level of maneuverability that we talked about with the combination of Moff Jergerod as well as take evasive action to increase both my first and last maneuver joint to a, its maximum yaw value. And in this case, I think I actually had a navigate dial used as well to increase my center joint to its maximum yaw value, which means I rotated around about 120 degrees, which is basically unheard of in this game. I was able to anchor the Star Destroyer off of one of my opponent's ships, so it didn't travel too far forward and ended up just dealing and receiving some ram damage instead of completing its maneuver. And that meant that I didn't move too close to my opponent's armored cruiser. Because I wasn't in close range of the armored cruiser, I wasn't really worried about 
about the Star Destroyer taking a couple shots from it because I had enough health regeneration to be able to eat those attacks, which meant that I could activate the Star Destroyer later in that turn to get a double arc attack onto my opponent's armored cruiser. I could then use the advantage of being first player and the maneuverability of Jerchrod to come around sharply and get another turn of double arcing the armored cruiser, which actually did an immense amount of damage to it, almost totaling the ship. I was able to get out of my opponent's very heavily diced side arcs with the Star Destroyer as well, which means that the armored cruiser couldn't deal too much damage back to me. It ended up being finished off by a couple side arc shots from the remaining Star Destroyer's guns and the laser beam off of the Onager Star Destroyer. I had placed a Gozanti in front of the Onager Star Destroyer, which meant it didn't actually have to move anywhere because it just kept dealing ram damage to the Gozanti, while the Gozanti moved up and pushed my squadrons to fight the Squadron War with my opponent's four X-Wings. A couple lucky attacks and some ram damage out of the Onager on the last two rounds were actually able to destroy the Torpedo Frigate as well, and my opponent was left with just her Scout Frigate as it traveled off the map. I had scored three of the salvage run objective tokens at that point and killed almost all of her ships, only losing a Gozanti cruiser in the process, which gave me a really big win to start out the day. Definitely a fun game. I do enjoy the salvage run objective, although, again, I might be a little bit biased because I, uh, I it's really good for Star Destroyers, but also it definitely shows off the sort of ridiculous amount of maneuverability that Jirjirad can pull out of his ships. Moving on to round two. I was 1-0, and with a big margin of victory, that gave me a 10-1 victory, which means I was going to be playing another opponent who also scored highly. This time I was playing against Eric and his Galactic Republic. He was playing Plo Koon with a very squadron-heavy list. This was a list running almost the maximum number of squadrons that you can bring. Only a third of your points can actually be spent on squadrons, which means most lists can only take 134 points worth of squadrons. And in this case, my opponent elected to spend those on six ARC-170 squadrons, Luminara Unduli, and Anakin Skywalker. Now, Plo Koon's Admiral ability benefits his generic squadrons, so those six ARC-170 squadrons that are near the Jedi commanders. That means that Anakin and Luminara will allow the ARC-170s that are nearby to move even if they're engaged by enemy squadrons. Plo Koon also gives those squadrons accuracies when they're attacking ships, which is especially effective for the ARC-170's massive bombing, as long as they're attacking an enemy ship that's near a friendly ship. So very much a commander that's based on the positioning, both of your ships and your opponents. The big carrier in the list is a Venator 1. The Venator is a really interesting ship because not only is it specced to be built as a carrier with a very high squadron value, meaning it can activate a ton of squadrons when it reveals a squadron command off of its stack, but it also is a big battleship with a bunch of dice and some pretty heavy defenses. This sort of creates some interesting contention in the commands that you're giving the ship, because while it wants to be activating early and revealing those squadron commands in order to send your squadrons in and alpha strike enemy squadrons, it also wants to be doing other dials that help it in in its more attrition-focused battleship role, which would be engineering or concentrate firepower. That said, the way that my opponent had built his list was very much trying to go second and force his opponent into engaging with him so that he can use those ARC-170s into more defensive capacity. The big downside of the ARC-170 squadron is that they are incredibly slow. Only speed two, which is the lowest speed of a squadron in the game, but he does have some technology in the list to pump that up. So, in addition to forcing his opponent to come in and engage with him because of the selection of his missions, he also has a Pelta Medical Frigate in the list with a Fighter Coordination Team and the All Fighters Follow Me Fleet Command on the Venator. All Fighters Follow Me allows you to spend a squadron token at the start of the round in order to increase the speed of all your squadrons by one, so that pushes the ARC-170s to speed three, and then the Pelta Medical Frigate allows you to move three squadrons distance one after it moves which means that it can carry three ARC-170s with it. So three of those ARC-170s are going to be sort of the equivalent of speed four-ish. The distance measurements in Armada are a little bit funky. The distance brackets are actually not the same size. So a distance one move is actually slightly longer than the difference between distance one and two, for example. So it's not exactly speed four. It's like speed four and a half, basically. But it definitely more than doubles the speed of those slow ARC-170s. And again, that's very scary because those ARC-170s are really good at brawling, but they do have the counter keyword, which allows them to attack ships that attack them back, just with less dice, and they are excellent at shooting enemy ships with two dice in their bombing armament. Lastly, we have a consular cruiser with the parts resupply upgrade to push some tokens into that Venator to allow it to turn on its synergies. 
Now, my opponent also didn't have a very big bid because I think he was trying to set up to go second. The downside is that I, I didn't feel comfortable taking second because allowing a player with squadrons to activate first is oftentimes a very bad idea. Normal ships in Armada just activate in an alternating activation sequence, which means starting with the first player, you'll go with the ship, your opponent will go with the ship, you'll go with another ship until all of the ships are done. Squadrons operate a little bit differently, though. If a ship reveals the squadron command, they can activate the number of squadrons equal to that command, which can then move and attack in whatever order they want. If they aren't ordered by a squadron command, squadrons will activate at the end of that round, essentially in another alternating activation sequence. So the first player will go with a couple squadrons, the second player will go with a couple squadrons until the squadrons are all done. This kind of gives the squadrons a turn of their own. The downside is that if they aren't ordered by a command, they can't move and attack. They can only do one or the other. But what this allows you to do as the first player is hold all your squadrons back, then at the bottom of the round during the squadron phase, move them all aggressively forward, then immediately activate first on the next round and order a bunch of those squadrons with one of your ships to move and bomb enemies or destroy their squadrons, whatever you want to do. Alternatively, you can just do sort of a standard double activation with squadrons where you activate late in the turn with your carrier to order the squadrons to attack. They go in and bomb something, then you activate the carrier first in the next round, and then the squadrons can bomb again and run away in order to avoid any retaliation. It gives you a lot more control over how your squadrons play if you're first player, so I ended up electing to take first player in this case to give myself that control. We ended up playing on my opponent's contested outpost, so he ended up putting a station around the center of the table, but obviously skewed towards his side, and we would score 20 points at the end of the round if we had a higher command value of ships within range one of the station. This is not too bad for me because my ships tend to be high command values being big Imperial ships, whereas my opponent would essentially have to park his Venator on that station in order to have a good chance of controlling it. I ended up skewing my Imperial Star Destroyer off to the left-hand side of the station, sort of with the idea of being able to target whichever my opponent's flanks were weak and move in, try to get a double activation, kill one or two of his ships, and then leave out of range of those squadrons. I also had the Onager pointed directly at the station because I knew that's where my opponent would have to be sitting, so I knew I could take some onager shots early at whatever was going to be on that station. I did mess up a little bit though. I placed my squadrons early. My opponent sort of massively out dropped me in the deployment step and I tried to use my squadrons as one deployment drop. My opponent had four drops worth of squadrons since you can deploy squadrons two at a time during the deployment phase instead of placing a ship. My, I was never going to see where my opponent's ships were going before all of my stuff was down. So what I should have done was just held the squadrons to put them in an optimal position to try to respond to where my opponent's squadrons were going, and that would give me the best opportunity to block my opponent's squadrons from attacking me. Now, I've played a ton of games with the Double Star Destroyer style of Imperial List, and a big weakness of the list is enemy squadrons. If you're not putting a lot of points into your own squadrons, you don't have enough screening to stop them from killing you. The normal play pattern in this style of mashup is to dial a bunch of engineering dials as basically as deep down into your stack as you can, put as many of your resources into performing those engineering actions as possible. Again, I can regenerate potentially four shields on that Star Destroyer every turn with all of the synergies active, and then basically set yourself at a very fast Fast speed, try to get a double activation on one of your opponent's carriers, kill it, and then try to leave as quickly as possible, since those squadrons will have to retain proximity to the carrier ship in order to continue to be activated optimally. Which means that if you just run away, your opponent doesn't really get the full use of their squadrons. And because Armada games only last six rounds, and usually the first one to two rounds aren't composed of much engagement, it's very difficult if my opponent tries to attack one ship and then retargets into another ship to kill either one because you can distribute enough damage over the entirety of your fleet that you don't end up actually giving up any VPs. So back in the olden times when I played Armada a lot more consistently and before everyone went on an 18 month hiatus while they were locked in their houses for, you know, some reason, that was definitely the game plan that I would have gone with. Instead, I... I did something else. I didn't dial engineering down the stack on the Star Destroyer, and I ended up coming in a little bit too slow. 
which meant that on turn two, my opponent was able to get a round of bombing onto my Star Destroyer to strip a lot of its shields. Now, I also made a mistake because I'm not very familiar with the new Clone Wars era abilities, and I had totally missed that Plo Koon also allowed my opponent's squadrons to activate when they're engaged by enemy squadrons and move and attack ships. So I ended up overextending with my two squadrons to try to lock down as many of my opponent's bombers as possible to try to stop them from getting all of their squadrons attacking the Star Destroyer before the Star Destroyer was able to make it to safety. He then activated normally. So a bunch of mistakes around turn two allowed all of my opponent's bombers to attack my Star Destroyer, which started eating the hull damage pretty quickly. Now, in response, I had elected to put as much firepower as possible into my opponent's Venator. Now, Venators are relatively tanky spaceships. They have a lot of shields, they have a reasonable number of hull, and they have some good defensive tokens. Putting all of my attacks into the Venator I'm not sure if it was 100% the right play. I ended up getting a shot out of the Onager into it at its long range, as well as a couple of shots out of the Star Destroyer. That did a bunch of shield damage, actually stripped all of its shields off after his special title, Tranquility, allowed him to move shields in response to attacks, and ended up starting to deal hull damage, which forced him to peel the Venator away from the Onager so that he didn't get into a protracted engagement and ended up being killed by the Onager. Because the Venator is his most expensive ship, if he loses the Venator, it would be very difficult to win the game, even if he kills a lot of my stuff. Now, this was very important because it meant that the Venator wasn't contributing its own firepower to the remainder of the fight. Instead, basically, it was just going to be pushing squadrons for the rest of the game. My Star Destroyer put as much resources as it could into keeping itself alive and tried to escape, although a couple of additional attacks from squadrons as well as one... Lucky shot out of the back arc of the Venator ended up killing it exactly. Because I had a Navigate instead of an Engineering dialed early when the squadrons first started attacking me, I could have repaired a couple of shield points earlier on in the game, which actually probably would have made the difference between victory and defeat for that poor Star Destroyer. The Onager had sped up and ended up actually taking the space station from my opponent for their last four rounds of the game and destroyed both my opponent's consular cruiser and the Pelta. And being pumped full of engineering tokens from my Gozantes was able to withstand the attacks from the fighters, especially once the Venator had left and the fighters were no longer being squadron activated by the carrier. Now, unfortunately, my Imperial Star Destroyer is wildly expensive, so it going down almost automatically means that I lose the game. Although, killing my opponent's two other ships and scoring a bunch of points by holding the space station meant that I was actually able to claw it back to a very close loss. This was almost essentially a draw with only a couple points difference between our two scores, which meant that in the margin of victory, it ended up being a 5-6 loss to me. My opponent ended up gambling a little bit with its consular cruiser on the last round and hoping that its defense tokens could keep it alive versus the Onager in the very late game and ended up staying in the fight a little bit longer than he should have and lost that ship. That's what made the final score so close and ended up being a really big deal for the final result of the tournament. Now, like I mentioned before, Star Wars Armada tournaments don't use a win-loss system for determining placement. It goes off pure margin of victory, which meant that because I had a big win in my first game and then a very close loss, even though my opponent was currently 2-0, we were actually just about tied. That meant that with another big win in the third round, even though I had gone down in this round, I still had a chance to win the tournament. And that moved me on to the final round of the event. This time, I was up against another Eric and his Super Star Destroyer. Now, I played against a Super Star Destroyer in my tournament the last week, and I actually ended up being killed by it. I had a lot of lighter ships, and the Super Star Destroyer was kitted out to deal a bunch of damage at long range, and I wasn't really able to contend with it. I had just a bunch of squadrons, and the downside of squadrons is that once your capital ships get taken out, the squadrons actually are considered destroyed as well. This list I was feeling much better, though, because I had a much tankier list that had a lot greater kind of spike damage output into a single target, and I thought that I had what it took to take out the Super Star Destroyer. Now, my opponent had a very interesting build of Super Star Destroyer, which is kind of non-standard. Typically, you see the Star Destroyer with a couple of Gozanti cruisers, maybe of a couple of squadrons to keep enemy bombers off for a turn or so, but kitted for maximum lethality out of the Star Destroyer itself. You can take things like the Ravager title, which allow its concentrate fire tokens to add additional dice. You can take XI-7 turbo lasers like my ships had in order to punch through shields. A lot of offensive upgrades that makes that Star Destroyer super duper dangerous. My opponent had actually elected to, instead of taking the maximum number of upgrades on the Super Star Destroyer, take a bunch of squadrons, which would allow him a much more effective game into enemy bomber heavy 
lists. That would, for example, make the matchup that I had played in my round two against the Venator and the Arc 170s a lot better, since the TIE Defenders that my opponent had could potentially keep the Arc 170s off of attacking the Star Destroyer for one or even two rounds and potentially kill a bunch of them, you know, even maybe winning that squadron fight because TIE Defenders are very effective squadrons. In my case, though, because I had Sienna and Valen, they could at least contend with the TIE Defenders and try to stop them from doing the maximum damage to my ships. I actually felt pretty confident, since especially it meant that the Super Star Destroyer was often going to be ordering squadrons to bomb me rather than regenerating shields or dealing additional damage. My opponent was also playing Moff Jirgerod. Uh, one of the downsides of the Super Star Destroyer is it actually can't turn when it moves unless it's being given navigate commands or has another effect like Moff Jirgerod active on it, which means Moff Jirgerod is a very popular commander to take with that Super Star Destroyer, especially since that him dealing damage to the ship with such a massive pool of shields and hull to take damage on it means that his downside isn't really a downside at all. The Destroyer was also upgraded with uh, quad battery turrets, which allows it to roll additional attack dice when it's attacking a ship that's going faster than it. Because it typically just stays at low speed, maybe speed one, or it caps out at speed two, this means that that upgrade will often trigger, especially since that you're typically going fast against the Super Star Destroyer to try to kind of rake its side and get out of its most effective arcs. My opponent also had SW7 Ion Cannons, which allowed him to, instead of spending accuracy results to stop me from using defense tokens, he can actually just add damage with them. A lot of times, only one or two accuracy results really matter, and because the Super Star Destroyer, especially alongside those quad battery turrets, is rolling potentially 10 or 11 attack dice, there, there might be a lot of accuracy icons you're not spending, which means those XW7s makes you a little bit more consistent with your damage output. Interestingly, he also had three officers on the Star Destroyer, one of them being Admiral Ozel, which allows the ship to make a speed one maneuver at the start of the game, meaning that like Minister Tua, he doesn't do anything once the game started. And because my opponent has Darth Vader on his Gozanti, Darth Vader can actually just start killing those officers in order to allow the Super Star Destroyer to reroll its attack dice. A nice sort of concise little combo there, since the game only lasts six rounds and you probably don't shoot for the first round or two. That means that my opponent can be killing those officers to reroll almost one attack every round, which is pretty effective. That's a lot of additional dice fixing if you really need it. Now, again, my opponent didn't have a bid, so I ended up electing to go first, which I think is kind of a must against the Super Star Destroyer, especially with a big punchy ship like the Imperial Star Destroyer, which can potentially get two rounds of shooting into it before peeling out. That allows you to drill through its shields and start dealing significant hull damage to the big thing. Now, it's important to mention as well, I think, that unlike normal ships that just give up their points value in VPs when they die, the Super Star Destroyer will give up half of its value if you reduce it to half hull points, which means that drilling through one shield section and dealing a bunch of hull damage all in one go and then leaving is a very legitimate strategy if you're not guaranteed to be able to destroy it. Now, because I had a close loss in my game two, I basically needed to destroy this thing in order to have a chance at placing highly in the tournament, which means that I had to play very aggressively. So let's talk about the game. I ended up placing relatively aggressively with my Imperial Star Destroyer in the center of the table and my Onager off to one side. I assumed that with Church Rod's mobility, I could turn to put that Onager shot into the Super Star Destroyer every round and potentially you do some wheeling and dealing with the Imperial Star Destroyer to try to get several turns of attacking it with my big front arc. That ended up working pretty well. I had my Star Destroyer sort of keyed up into my opponent's front arc. I ended up eating a big attack out of the Super Star Destroyer, which my opponent rolled lights out on. No rerolls required. I think it just rolled something like seven or eight damage with a bunch of accuracy icons, which was pretty brutal. Although without XI-7 turbo lasers on the Super Super Star Destroyer, I was able to redirect a lot of it and ended up only taking two or three hull damage that my reinforced blasters took care of. I then shot through all of the front shields of the Super Star Destroyer and used Jirtra's ability to get the Imperial Star Destroyer out of the Super Star Destroyer's front arc. I put a lot of my resources into engineering in order to repair the shield damage that had been dealt to the Imperial Star Destroyer and then got a double activation to get another double arc attack into the Super Star Destroyer to take out a lot of its side shields and deal massive hull damage as well. My opponent hadn't been expecting me to be able to get out of the Super Star Destroyer's front arc and thought he could either pin the Imperial Star Destroyer in place to get killed by the front arc of the Super Star Destroyer or force the Imperial Destroyer to run away and not really participate in the game. Instead, Jirgerad's maneuverability allowed me to get it out of danger and allow it to continue to double arc the SSD. 
My opponent's Jerjrod allowed the SSD to use its own mobility to then essentially pin my Onager Destroyer in place in its front arc. This was, I think, fine for me because while my opponent had eventually killed my two squadron aces, which allowed his defenders and bombers to start bombing my ships, I was able to kind of keep them at bay with anti-squadron fire and actually almost killed most of them just with the amount of chip damage that my list was capable of putting out against squadrons. But because my Onager Destroyer had had that five shields in the front and my opponent couldn't draw line of sight to any of my additional arcs I was actually pretty okay with tanking a bunch of damage on that Onager Destroyer especially since with the Salvo defense token it can be dealing damage back to the Super Star Destroyer while it's engaged. I used shields to maximum and my comms net to pour as many shields onto the Onager Destroyer as possible to try to take as much damage as I could from that Super Star Destroyer's front arc and I think the Onager ended up eating two full shots from it without really suffering too much damage. One of them, my opponent did make a little bit of a misplay and rolled a pretty bad roll. I think only three or four damage with that front arc and a bunch of accuracies and elected to use Vader to kill one of his officers to reroll all of the dice. He didn't keep any accuracies aside to use to stop my brace or my salvo attacks and ended up rolling no accuracy effects on the reroll, which meant that the Onager was allowed to brace and move that damage around to different hull zones to keep itself alive. That was a big deal because I think with a big hit there, my opponent could potentially have been in range to kill the Onager, but the Onager ended up unscathed with relatively little hull damage dealt. To make matters worse, on round five, my opponent was down to just seven or so hull points left on the Super Stratus and the Onager was able to roll the perfect accuracies and damage to shoot its big super laser directly through the center of the Super Star Destroyer and triumphantly jet through its smoldering remains. Because the Super Star Destroyer was my opponent's only capital ship, flotillas don't count, that ended up meaning that my opponent was counted as tabled on round five and didn't have the opportunity to try to finish off that Onager with a couple of more additional attacks from his squadrons. So with that, that actually gave me a second 10 in one finish to complement my round one finish and to make up for my very middling loss in round two. Now I mentioned in my round two game that my opponent being a little bit too aggressive with his consular cruiser was actually very impactful for the final standings of the tournament. And the reason for that is because my round two opponent and I were almost neck and neck for the first place finish. Even though my opponent had actually won all of their games, because they didn't win them with super big victories to make up for a sort of middling result in that round two game, I actually ended up beating them out on the final score. So even though my opponent went undefeated and beat me in round two, because my first and last games I scored much higher, I ended up actually taking first place in the tournament instead of them. Now, first off, super excited that I won the tournament. I'm actually sort of perennially kind of like a gatekeeper player. Not that I try to stop people from playing the game for stupid reasons, but that I am kind of a, a person that the person who wins the tournament usually like beats in their second round or whatever. So being able to take down a tournament was pretty exciting. I will say though, that the situation that occurs where I can lose to a player who goes undefeated and then score higher than them kind of adds some sourness to that final result. I think I've talked about it before, maybe not on the channel, but certainly elsewhere, that I think Armada has some of the cleanest, deepest, and most well-designed core mechanics of any game on the market. The maneuvering, attacking, upgrade cards, list building, four Star Wars Armada is all phenomenal. The downside is that margin of victory scoring makes it almost untenable as a competitive game. If you consider it, while you're playing a casual game with your friends, whether or not you win by 20 points or 200 points doesn't make a huge difference. And oftentimes that means that you're more incentivized to play more interesting, aggressive games. In a tournament situation, however, that kind of falls apart where your matchups will sort of determine your placing a lot more than your actual play. If you get good matchups where your opponent isn't really ready to face your list, or you play against some people that maybe aren't familiar with what your stuff can do, and you end up smashing them, that's worth a lot more than two players who are very close in skill getting a 5-6 or a 7-4 margin of victory. 
It's really unfortunate for the system because I think it could be a very good competitive game and I don't actually think it's insurmountable. I actually wrote an entire document for a win-loss Swiss pair style scoring system for Armada that would be more effective in tournament play. It has missions and a special objective card. You can actually find a link to it over on the Tactical Tortoise Facebook page if you want to take a look through it. I will say it's not perfect and it doesn't support every style of fleet perfectly, but I do think it makes the game more interesting by forcing more maneuver-based aggressive play rather than trying to conserve points in order to preserve your score. It also means that you don't ever run into the situation where you can lose to someone who goes undefeated and then beat them in the final standings, which is kind of a feel-bads all around, to be honest. So anyway, moving forward, I know the local community here for Star Wars Armada, despite Atomic Mass Games' recent announcement, is going to continue playing and putting on events and supporting the game, at least in an organized standpoint. And I hope the online and international community for the game continues as well. I do think that it is one of the most well-designed games currently out there, and I certainly hope it doesn't just sort of fall down and die. Like I said in my video about AMG's announcement, I do hope that their announcement is basically just a placeholder for future releases and that maybe we see a resurgence in Star Wars Armada over the next couple of years after they finished getting this release after release of Star Wars Legion stuff out of the way. But we'll just have to see what the future holds for the game. If you want to see more Star Wars Armada content, I'll certainly make it if people will watch it. So let me know down in the comment section if you enjoy this style of video. I also play a bunch of different games. So if you like to see coverage of games that aren't just Warhammer 40k and other games workshop games, go ahead and let me know down there as well, because I would be happy to make videos and content and battle report and stuff like that for all sorts of other games. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. I want to throw a big shout out to the tournament organizers of this event. Uh, Eric, who I played in the final round, was actually one of the tournament organizers and ended up putting up a bunch of super cool prizes. Everyone got some special alternate art prizes promo stuff, some special acrylic defense tokens, which were super sick, as well as some measuring tools, squadron proxy bases, all sorts of really cool, unique prizes that you can't really get anywhere else. Also, quick shout out to everyone who supports the channel, YouTube channel members, patron supporters, as well as Twitch subscribers. All those people are phenomenal and I love them very much. Thanks so much for supporting and everyone else. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and if happy wargaming.